Okay, it's uh, five past, so let's get started. Good day, everybody. My name is uh, Sridhar Ranganathan. I work for Kimberly Clark Corporation, and this morning it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Roseanne Ford from the University of Virginia for her keynote lecture on the transport of chemotactic bacteria in porous media with residual sources of chemical pollutants. And you can see the sponsors for Interpore. Interpore is, uh, uh, you know, such a cross uh, uh, industry organization. That's one of the uh, exciting parts of uh, this conference for me. And I look forward to the talk that Professor Ford is going to be giving this morning. As introduction, Professor Ford uh, is a professor of chemical engineering at the University of Virginia. And her lab is focused on research around microbial transport processes especially in the context of environmental uh, remediation. So they do experimental work and modeling work that range both in length scale and time scales from the real small levels in microfluidic devices to all the way to field scale experiments where she has done uh, work and you know she'll touch upon uh, the entire breadth of it, I'm sure, this morning. Uh, as background, we were just chatting right before this that uh, she also has a degree from the University of Delaware where I went to school for my graduate program and her graduate degrees are from the University of Pennsylvania. And she has held uh, visiting appointments at the US Geological Survey in uh, Boulder and also has been a visiting professor at uh, EPFL in uh, Lausanne, Switzerland. Uh, she also has an or was appointed as the William Keenan Jr. Visiting Professor for Distinguished Teaching at Princeton recently and was elected to the American Institute of Medical and Biological Engineering. Uh, she has also gotten a teaching award, which is the Cavalier's Distinguished Teaching Professorship, which is the highest teaching award given at the University of Virginia. I look forward to hearing uh, your talk, Professor Ford. I take it away. Please take it away. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. If I can go ahead and share my screen. Okay, I hope everyone's just seeing my first slide. Well, greetings, it. everyone, and thank you, Sadar, for that kind introduction. I also really appreciate the invitation from the conference committee. Today, I'll present some of what we've learned about the movement of microorganisms through porous media in the presence of chemical attractants. And I want to acknowledge the contributions of a current PhD student, Bebe Gao, and a former PhD student, Xiaopu Wang, who's now an associate professor at China University of Petroleum. One motivation for our work is environmental cleanup of chemically polluted groundwater using in situ bioremediation. So consider this scenario. Petroleum hydrocarbons leak from an underground storage tank into the aquifer below, where dispersion and dilution create a contaminant plume that's difficult to remediate. Low solubility in aqueous phase and entrapment in the soil matrix, especially in zones with low permeability, present challenges for pump and treat scenarios and limit bioavailability for biodegradation to occur. So bacteria that are capable of degrading hydrocarbons, shown here, are naturally present at these contaminated sites. The key for bioremediation is getting the bacteria and the hydrocarbon in close proximity to each other. In this study, we'll examine chemotaxis. This is a transport process that draws swimming bacteria to hard to reach pollutants that are not readily accessible to groundwater flow. So the question we want to address is what role does chemotaxis play in this process? I like to think of bacteria as a catalyst for biodegradation, but this bacteria has two special properties. One is a sense of smell to detect contaminants, and this is called chemotaxis. And two is the bacteria are self-propelled and are able to swim at um, fat, very fast speeds of about 20 body lengths a second. Individual bacteria can modulate their swimming patterns in response to chemical gradients in their surroundings. And at the population level, the collective motion of these individual bacteria form a traveling wave that moves toward the chemical source. So in this video that you're seeing, 
Pseudomonas putida bacteria, shown here in yellow, swim toward orange polystyrene beads that are releasing toluene into the surrounding suspension of bacteria. The chemotactic velocity at which the band moves in an otherwise quiescent fluid is proportional to the concentration gradient of the chemoattractant, the Laplacian of A. And in this case, the chemoattractant is the hydrocarbon toluene. The chemotactic sensitivity coefficient, chi zero, is the strength of the response for a particular bacteria attractant pair. And the chemotaxis receptor constant, Kc, is an indicator of the attractant concentration to which the bacteria are most sensitive. So we use this expression to quantify the chemotactic velocity of the bacterial population moving toward a chemical attractant. We must also consider two complexities associated with hydrocarbon contaminated aquifers. First, oil and water don't mix. So hydrocarbons released into groundwater can end up as oil blobs that get trapped within granular media as illustrated in this laboratory column. These can serve then as long-term sources of contamination that slowly leach into the surrounding aqueous phase. The second complexity is the structure of the porous matrix. Bacteria may have to alter their swimming trajectories as they navigate around the obstacles represented by grains to reach the contaminant source. Our overarching research goal in this project is to connect the poor scale phenomena to core scale observations across multiple length scales that can span microns to meters. We make two observations. First of all, micron sized bacteria are able to accumulate around an oil droplet containing a pollutant and a mixture of chemotactic bacteria injected into a sand pack column that contains residual oil droplets will elute from the column with different concentration profiles depending on whether the bacteria are chemotactic, non-chemotactic, non and whether the column is contaminated with or without oil. So we propose ultimately to use dimensionless groups that are independent of units to relate these two observations that span orders of magnitude. To briefly outline my talk, in part one, I'll describe the differences in breakthrough curves for chemotactic and non-chemotactic bacteria from sand columns containing residual chemoattractants. These differences motivated us to want to look inside the column to try to explain them. Of course, we can't see directly inside the column. So uh, in part two, I'll describe computer simulations of our experimental system, which allowed us to visualize bacterial and attractant concentrations inside the column. These simulations suggested that bacteria accumulate around residual oil droplets. In part three, we used a micro model to allow direct observation of bacteria in the vicinity of trapped oil contaminants to confirm what our simulations suggested. So for part one, Adadavo and coworkers conducted experiments with two different forms of chemoattractants that were distributed throughout the sand packed column. These were naphthalene as a crystalline solid and naphthalene dissolved within the oil, HMN, hepta uh, methylnonine. The crystalline solids are roughly the same size as sand grains, and although we weren't able to measure the oil blobs, we expect them also to be comparable in size to the sand grains. Interestingly, Dadavo and co-workers reported similar breakthrough curves for both sources, although the aqueous solubility of naphthalene is higher for the crystalline solids than for the oil phase sources. And also they noticed chemotactic bacteria eluded from the column upon a five times increase in the flow rate for the crystalline solid sources, but not for naphthalene contained within the oil phase. I'll describe these experiments in more detail now. A mixture of chemotactic and non-chemotactic bacteria that were labeled with different fluorescent markers were injected as a pulse input into the sand column. The sand column was saturated with buffer and contained residual naphthalene sources. 
then bacterial concentrations in the effluent were monitored and are plotted as the normalized concentration as a function of dimensionless time or pore volume. These so-called breakthrough curves correspond to characteristics of transport that occurred within the column, interactions with the contaminant sources that are averaged over the whole bacterial population and over the length of the column. So here I show the breakthrough curves for the chemotactic bacteria and a non-chemotactic control in, with naphthalene crystals and with naphthalene contained within an oil phase. Note that the oil phase contaminants occupy about 20% of the void space in the column, and so they elute earlier as a result. But otherwise, the retention of the chemotactic bacteria in both these cases looks similar. The percent recovery in the oil phases is only about 30% less than in the solids, although the solubility is less than half that of the crystalline solids. The second observation is once the primary peak eluded from the column, the fluid velocity was increased five times, and then a second peak eluded from the column with naphthalene crystals as the source. Presumably, releasing bacteria that had been drawn toward the naphthalene crystals and retained at the lower fluid velocity. For the oil phase, naphthalene sources, it appears that the chemotactic bacteria became irreversibly sorbed at the oil water interface and did not release even at the higher flow rate. Based on these observations, we formulated the following hypothesis. The chemotaxis directs bacteria from preferred flow paths to trap naphthalene sources, and in the case of oil droplets, increases the likelihood of absorption to the oil water interface. To test this hypothesis, we use computer simulation to look inside the column. Because the sandpack column is opaque, we're unable to see the bacterial concentrations inside the column. So as an alternative approach, we simulated the experiment in silico and visualized the results. We solved the transport equations for bacteria and naphthalene. Here, I superimposed output from the simulations showing bacterial concentrations inside the column. The red hot spots are higher concentrations of bacteria and the cool blue areas represent lower concentrations. Visualization of computer simulations based on our model for chemotaxis gives us some insight as to what's happening within the column. On the far left, the random distribution of naphthalene sources is presented. Next to that, you can see the distribution of naphthalene um, within the column. You can see that the concentration in the bulk fluid increases along the length of the column from low to high as naphthalene is released from the oil sources. Individual point sources are also available or are also visible as distinct dots of color against a lower concentration of surrounding bulk fluid. Bacterial concentrations are also shown for chemotactic and non-chemotactic bacteria at two different times, 47 minutes and 71 minutes. Notice the distributions of chemotactic bacteria appear to be very patchy, right? And you see these red hot spots, especially near the inlet to the column. And this is in contrast to the non-chemotactic bacteria in which the initial pulse input that looks Gaussian is maintained along the length of the column, but does spread as a result of dispersion over time. We solved continuum level transport equations for bacteria in the mobile fluid phase, including terms for equilibrium absorption, dispersion, advection, and chemotaxis, as well as kinetic sorption and desorption. And we also um, included an immobile phase that either represented the sand or the immobile oil 
So the only difference between the simul well, I should mention that in the immobile phase, um, this kinetic absorption coefficient was much higher for the oil phase, um, essentially making absorption to the oil irreversible. And the only difference between simulations for chemotactic and non-chemotactic bacteria was the chemotactic velocity was set to zero in the control case for non-chemotactic bacteria. Now you'll recall that chemotaxis depends on the concentration gradient of naphthalene, the chemoattractant to which it's, it's um, moving toward. And so we also needed to include equations for the chemoattractant naphthalene. We um, included dispersion, advection, and also this term to represent the discrete sources within the column. Numerical solution by finite L method was performed for these coupled partial differential equations using COMSOL multiphysics software. Our numerical solutions of the transport equations allowed us to visualize the distribution of bacteria within the sand column. The results indicate that chemotactic bacteria accumulate near point sources of chemoattractants such as naphthalene. Thus, we expect to be able to observe these same hot spots of bacterial accumulation in glass micromodels where we can directly observe what's happening at the pore scale. In the pore scale experiments, a micromodel with regions of high and low permeability was initially filled with oil, then flushed with water, which forced out most of the oil, except some residual in these regions of low permeability and near the, the junctions. The oil trapped within the interstices of the micromodel took different structural forms. There were um, blobs, singlets, and coatings. And you can see these in the images where the oil is black, the bacterial suspension is red, and the white dashed lines represent the interface between the oil and the bacterial suspension. In our analysis, we're gonna focus primarily on these regions um, between the low permeability and high permeability zone um, where we retain these um, oil ganglia as shown in this upper right-hand image. Using video microscopy, we observed the distribution of bacteria then near the oil water interfaces. The purpose of these experiments was to be able to see directly what we couldn't see inside the sand column. The suspension of bacteria flowed through the void space between the circular posts that represented grains in our microfluidic device. The distributions of chemotactic bacteria were compared here for two different flow paths that contain some residual oil shown in the brown. Notice on the left that chemotactic bacteria, which appear as red specks, accumulate near the oil source, while on the right-hand side, there's no noticeable accumulation. We attribute this to the reduced velocity in the pore that's blocked by the oil ganglia on the left. In this region, the chemotactic velocity induced by the gradient in naphthalene appears to be greater than the fluid velocity. This observation is consistent with the greater retention of chemotactic bacteria that we saw in breakthrough curves from our column experiments at the core scale. To confirm that the accumulation was due to chemotaxis, we also compared it to a non-chemotactic mutant shown here as green specks on the right. For the non-chemotactic mutant, the bacterial distribution looks relatively uniform without any increased concentration near the oil. We quantified the accumulation for chemotactic bacteria in this scenario and compared it to several different experimental controls. The images are snapshots of bacterial distributions in the pore space near residual oil. First, we compared the accumulation of chemotactic bacteria in red and non-chemotactic bacteria in green in the presence of naphthalene and we plotted the normalized accumulation over time. We saw a dramatic increase for the chemotactic bacteria around the 40 minute mark and essentially observed 
no change for the control case with non-chemotactic bacteria. In this next set of control experiments, there was no naphthalene present in the dissolved oil, or in the oil phase. So no chemoattractant was available and no accumulation occurred for either the chemotactic or the non-chemotactic bacteria. In this last set of controls that I'm showing, in the top, we made the bacteria non-modal by shearing off their flagella, and we didn't see any accumulation near the oil interfaces. Finally, we increased the fluid velocity five times, in this case, using chemotactic bacteria and with naphthalene. But at the higher flow rate, it appeared that the fluid velocity dominated over chemotaxis. This suggests that fluid velocity is an important parameter for consideration in being able to predict the conditions in which chemotaxis plays a significant role in bacterial transport. Now returning to our overarching research goal to connect poor scale phenomena to core scale observations that span orders of magnitude. Dimensionless groups have no dimensions and thus are independent of scale. And we expect chemotactic velocity and fluid velocity to be important parameters to include in our dimensionless groups. You may already be familiar with dimensionless group known as the Reynolds number. And the Reynolds number compares the trans momentum transport um, by, of inter, sorry, it compares transport of fluid momentum by inertial forces and viscous forces. And in pipe flow, a Reynolds number greater than 2100 indicates a transition from laminar to turbulent flow. The Peclet number compares mass transport by advective and diffusive processes. For large Peclet numbers, transport is controlled by advection. So we propose a chemotaxis number that compares transport of bacterial mass by chemotaxis to advection, essentially a chemotactic velocity to an advective velocity. And we expect chemotaxis to dominate for large values of this chemotaxis number or large values of the chemotactic sensitivity coefficient. Another useful grouping is the ratio of the chemotaxis receptor constant to the aqueous solubility of the chemoattractant, which gives us an idea of the optimal concentration to which the bacteria will respond. So these dimensionless numbers can be used to establish criteria for which we expect chemotaxis to be important. We evaluated the chemotaxis number here, shown on the horizontal axis, for several experimental studies from the literature. And those studies are listed here with the corresponding value of the chemotaxis number along that same horizontal. The red symbols indicate experiments in which chemotaxis was observed and the black ones where it wasn't. And we notice a division around a chemotaxis number of one. Most of the red symbols fall to the right and most of the black symbols fall to the left. It's not a perfect separation. And I'll also note that some of the outliers um, have dimensionless, very high values for dimensionless groups of that Peckling number and the alpha parameter. We can also use dimensionless groups to construct empirical correlations to compare observations across a wide range of length scales and parameter values. So this is still a work in progress as we continue to collect and analyze more experimental data. But we do observe an increasing trend of accumulation with increasing chemotaxis number for a chemotaxis number greater than one. And as a point of reference for the, the black symbols here, for the cases in which chemotaxis was not observed, there's no accumulation above a base level. The dimensionless ratio for accumulation is about equal to one and it's independent of the chemotaxis number. I'll leave you with these concluding remarks. In porous media, heterogeneity in the physical structure can lead to chemical heterogeneity. For example, groundwater pollutants may become trapped within the interstices of the soil matrix, and that reduces their bioavailability for in situ bioremediation. Chemotactic bacteria, though, can use this chemical heterogeneity to direct their migration toward pollutants, which serve as carbon sources for energy and proliferation. The distances over which bacteria can detect and respond to chemical gradients are on the order of just tens of microns 
And we were able to observe this poor scale transport phenomena directly in micro models. And then we saw it manifest itself at larger length scales in breakthrough curves from sandpack columns. So finally, to be able to connect chemotaxis across multiple scales, we propose to use a dimensionless number that compares the strength of the chemotactic response measured at one scale in the laboratory to another such as in situ by remediation at the field scale. The goal is to be able to predict the conditions under which, to predict the conditions a priori, I should say, under which chemotaxis will play a critical role in microbial transport for a wide range of different applications. And finally, let me acknowledge the sponsors of this work, the National Science Foundation, National Institutes of Health, and the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative. And I also want to acknowledge many colleagues and coworkers who contributed to this work in various ways and others who shared laboratory resources and access to equipment to complete this work. Thank you, and I'm happy to address questions at this point. Thank you so much, Dr. Ford. Let's see if uh, we have questions from the audience. And I don't know, Lifei, are you gonna unmute audience members or how are we doing the questions? Okay, Willie's got a question. If you would unmute yourself and ask the question, please. And I can see Willie has raising his hand. I think he can talk now. Yeah, Willie, please go ahead. Okay, we're having trouble with uh, audio, it looks like. Yeah, well, while that's getting sorted out, uh, Professor Ford, I was, so this is fascinating to uh, listen to how you're using some of the natural attraction that bacteria have to certain uh, other chemicals to get to where natural flow doesn't get to. So my question was, are there specific bacteria attractant and degradant combinations that are fairly well established? So for example, if I had, you know, a certain type of element or contaminant that I'm trying to remove, are there certain naturally co-occurring contaminants that then I would have a set of bacteria that I could use for this purpose? Yes, um, generally speaking, bacteria, um, if they're exposed for long times um, in a region that is contaminated, the ones that are able to make use of that contaminant um, will have an advantage. And so they will, um, you'll start to see a prevalence of organisms that are able to break down particular chemical contaminants at that site. And if they are modal, then um, if they're gonna exert all that energy for motility, it turns out that they also wanna be able to direct that in a particular way to make the most of that. Um, and so, yes, there is a correlation between being able to chemotactically respond and also being able to degrade a particular compound. Oh, wow, okay. Okay. If, if others have questions, just raise your hand and our uh, Zoom host will uh, unmute you and then you should, be able to, you should be able to ask your question directly to Dr. Ford. You know, another question, I love this. Oh, uh, Mark Flurry. Yes, yes. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I wonder if you... Uh, thought about using uh, magnetic resonance imaging for realizing uh, accumulation of, of, of bacteria in the sand column, uh, which should work and be compatible with uh, living organisms? Yeah, that's a great suggestion. And in the past, we have done that. Um, we were able to tag bacteria with magnetite particles and observe yeah. their distributions. And this was in columns where we did not have flow so in that case, um, the only way we could figure out what was going on inside was to, to try to um, uh, visualize it directly using magnetic resonance imaging. But yeah, that's a great suggestion. Um, yeah, the, you, know, could, yeah. you could even uh, determine uh, diffusion properties or uh, that could be very useful to, to uh, characterize emotions. We'd definitely be open to collaboration with people who have some experience with that and access to MRI imaging. Okay. Thanks for your question. 
Willie, I see your hand up. Are you able to? Uh, is your audio working now? Is uh, you know, in terms of keeping this uh, chemotactic velocity high enough, I know you talked about some of the uh, maybe parameters like the uh, uh, attraction coefficient and gradients. As you've looked at these various geometries, are there particular kinds of geometries that are still hard to keep this VC high enough compared to sort of the background velocity or is reducing the background velocity the only way to ensure that you can actually get into certain parts of the geometry? So in other words, you know, how do you manipulate that number, the dimensionless number that you have? Uh, is dropping the background velocity the the main control knob or are there other ways in which you could attack, uh, you know, affect that chemotaxis number? Yeah, so the, the critical thing is also the concentration gradient. So um, we also think about it in terms of dispersion. So if you have a lot of dispersion, you are getting some mixing, which presumably is reducing those chemical mm -hmm. gradients, flattening mm -hmm. them out. So I think it's interesting that the places where it's hardest to actually remove the contaminants, right? Where the dispersion's low, where the velocity is low, is mm -hmm. where chemotaxis makes the most sense. And so, yes, um, reducing the velocity currently is, um, you know, one of the, like, as you mentioned, one of the knobs that we're okay. turning that seems to be, at least in experimental studies, you know, one of the easier ones to manipulate. And I would say the complexity of the geometry where you have regions of high and low flow, that obviously will also impact um, right. um, the extent to which you observe chemotaxis. Uh, Mamta Jotkar. Hi, that, that's me. Um, hi, thank you for the nice talk. Uh, and I'm really sorry, I think I missed the first uh, few minutes. So I have a quick question related to the numerical modeling. Um, how do you, when you're modeling the bacteria, do you, uh, does the bacteria account for diffusion? The first thing and the second is, uh, uh, d can you treat it as an Eulerian or uh, do, you, do you do a Lagrangian approach for the bacteria? So um, the first question was, we do account for bacterial diffusion. So that would be um, in regions where there's no chemical attractant, um, they would be randomly dispersing. And I believe we're using Lagrangian approach um, to solve these equations. Um, in this particular example, we used ComSol multiphysics. Okay. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I think somebody else had a question. No. Okay, are there other questions for uh, Dr. Okay? Sang Lee has a question. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, Sang, please go ahead. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. And I have one question. Um, do these bacteria that you um, are experimenting with, are they able to penetrate into the oil phase? No, they do not. That's a great question. Um, they don't penetrate the oil phase and they don't penetrate the, the sand grains. Um, so so yeah. what, what, inter what happens is if they're close to a solid surface, they will, you know, try to swim to it. And because of the resistance near the surface, they tend to turn and swim along the surface until they naturally tumble and um, swim back into the bulk fluid. But the surface interactions are very interesting. I see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, so essentially all the... Uh all the interaction happens at the surface and not in the bulk. Um, the interaction with the contaminant, you mean? With the contaminant, yeah. Right, just because that happens to be where the source is yeah. coming from. Okay, okay. okay. I know your talk has given me uh, at least a couple of different ideas for follow-up for a completely different set of applications. So, you know, I'd love to follow up and, you know, try and understand how we could use some of these uh, types of models in other fields so i'd love to get in touch and have a discussion but if there are any other questions please raise your hand otherwise i'd love to thank professor ford uh, for an excellent talk this morning and uh, 
you know, okay, let me see. One one last call, Professor Ford, and then we'll see if Absolutely. Uh, Willie, are you able to ask a question? I can see Willie's hand up, but I think Willie's have an audio trouble. Please feel free to follow up by posting your question on the uh, Hoover site with the Professor Ford's presentation. So what we'll do is we'll go check for any follow-up questions on that site also and uh, get those questions uh, answered for you. But thank you again, uh, Professor Ford, for an excellent talk this morning, uh, US time, and hope the participants also uh, enjoyed the presentation as much as I did. My pleasure. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks for your questions too. I appreciate it. Have a great <laughs> afternoon. Thanks.